<laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you for your patience, Madam Clerk. Councilmember Von Rudenberg? Here. Deputy Mayor Canestrino? Here. Deputy Mayor Sims? Here. Councilmember Battaglia? Here. Mayor LaBrosse? Here. This meeting is being held in accordance with the Open Public Meeting Act, NJSA 10 colon 4 6 at sec. Notice having been published according to law with a copy on file in the City Clerk's Office and a copy posted on the bulletin board in City Hall. Thank you. Would everybody please rise for the flag salute? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. And with that, we'll move to the uh, city manager's report. He's in a different seat today. Um, first presentation is a veteran friendly municipality program. Uh, Peter Lupo, please. Good evening. For the record, my name is Lieutenant Colonel Pete Lupo. I'm the Vice President of the New Jersey Veterans Chamber of Commerce. I serve as the uh, Public Affairs Officer as well as Legislative Outreach for the Chamber of Commerce. Can you hear me better now? Yes. I just want to first thank uh, Ted Ehrenberger for um, the initial point of contact and having me come to his office and uh, give him the initial presentation and getting me on tonight's agenda. So just to give a little background, what we specialize in this Chamber of Commerce, the New Jersey Veterans Chamber of Commerce, is trying to level the playing field for New Jersey veterans. So what a lot of people don't uh, understand, um, if they're not in the Reserve or National Guard, is that um, veteran people who deploy or National Guard Reserve and have their own businesses uh, find themselves going away for a year, year and a half. So if you're a mom and pop shop and you come back and you, for example, you're a landscaper, um, the world goes on. Grass still needs to be cut, weeds need to be pulled, uh, work needs to be done on lawns. And if you're in Afghanistan, your needs and the lawn cut still remains. What happens for a lot of people is they go to other uh, companies to start using the work and they get used to using them. So by the time the veteran comes back, after a year, year and a half of being deployed, he finds his entire business uh, completely gone. So what we try to um, do is try to alleviate some of these disadvantages that veterans face in the state. So we, what my job is to go around knocking on doors and making appointments to see people like Ted and pitch um, this New Jersey Veterans um, uh, Friendly Municipality Certification Program that we have. So we ask three things. The first is three reserve parking signs for either uh, veterans or Gold Star family members. Gold Star family members, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, family members who lost a loved one in combat. The second thing we ask for is a 5% um, goal. It's simply a goal of hiring 5% of the municipality with veterans. And the third thing we ask for is uh, a 6% set aside, um, which is permitted under New Jersey public contract law for New Jersey uh, veterans. So that's certified veteran-owned businesses or service disabled veteran-owned businesses. So that's something that's, you're vetted through the uh, VA, very long process, and you get a certification, you get a un unique nomenclature number, or you can go to the VA website and check if the person is uh, a veteran. So what we ask for is you get 6% of any municipal bids that the municipality has. This would help alleviate some, um, some of the disadvantages we have. Uh, again, uh, we come back, we don't have a business, we don't have work, and this would help in a way that we would be able to build our businesses and would be at no cost to the municipality. We still have to be competitive with our bids. So um, in the end, you get the benefit of veterans and it doesn't cost the municipality any extra money. So that's uh, the, this is what I'm here for. This is why I'm mm -hmm. hoping for discussion and hopefully for passage. And um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer anything. My only question is on the municipal contracts, because you know we're restricted to on how, how we, you know, we go for a bid process. So how does that work? The R, yeah, for the request for bids. Yeah. So um, again, we have to be competitive. We are you are permitted under New Jersey public contract law to do a set aside for three types of businesses. Mm -hmm. One is women-owned business. Second is minority, and the third set aside is for veteran-owned businesses. So you are permitted under law to do that. Uh, we have to be competitive. So as long as uh, it's for a certified veteran business and we're competitive with the other bidders, then you're permitted under state law to go ahead and do that. Do you know what the criteria for the word competitive means, I guess, reasonably close to, say, the low bid? Correct. Right? Okay. Exactly, Mayor. I have a question about the parking. A lot of towns may have, like, one or two large parking lots. We have a lot of parking lots 
throughout the city, and some of them aren't that large, but we have a vast number of them. So are we talking about three spots per lot or three spots in general? Well, we're just asking for um, per three throughout the municipality. So okay. if we have three signs so three sprinkled. The town. Correct. Okay. Deputy Mayor. Yep. That's reason. Okay. All right. I think we can definitely go with good faith on municipal contracts. I definitely think we can go good faith effort to achieve. I'd like to see what our status is, Jim is in, in our workforce. Jim is in the audience. Jim, CFO. do you know by chance our, our percentage of workforce that's veterans now? I'm, I'm talking about contract. Oh, for contract for, for doing our awarding purchasing. You might know the other one. Yeah, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm not aware of the set aside for veterans. I am aware of the, the women-owned business, the minority-owned business. Um, but I got to stay up to speed on the local public contracts law. Um, but it, put it this way, no matter what, we already do it for women-owned business, minority-owned minority businesses, and so it wouldn't be a heavy lift to include that for veterans. Yeah, that, that wouldn't be a problem. Okay. okay. You wouldn't Thanks. by chance know workforce-wise where we are as far as veteran work. No, no. Um, and, Ted, you'd have to sure. find I checked. I thought we would exceed that um, by a large degree. We don't, but we're very close right now. I think we're probably meeting that criteria, but I have to go back and do a count to the fire department and the police department because obviously the civil service doesn't mm -hmm. kick in for the DPW per se. Right. So, but I think we're close. And what was the percentage? Five percent. It's, it's targeted goal, Deputy Mayor. We can do that as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, I have no issue with this resolution or, or this ordinance. And I'm happy to provide the provision under the New Jersey, New Jersey public contract law to Jimmy, um, the exact provisions to save a little extra time to have to dig around on that. It's not a problem. Mm -hmm. Good. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll speak soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next on the list for the city is the Environmental Commission has a Colesbrook Serenity Garden proposal. Good evening, Mayor, Council, City Manager, City Employees, Gary Tizano, Hackensack Environmental Commission Chairman. Uh, tonight, we are going to make a presentation on some ideas we have for Stide Park. And just to bring everybody up to speed on how this came about, uh, back in the summer, there were plans to build a dog park in the wooded area along Davis in Stide Park and uh, there were some residents that weren't too happy with that so uh, that was not going forward in the plans for the whole park. Um, we st we, the city was good enough to have a, a public meeting in the park uh, organized by city manager Ted Ehrenberg. Council came, DPW, some engineers and a lot of the residents voiced their opinions and feelings on the dog park. Well, that took place on a paved area that's been over there for quite a few years in, in the, on the western end of the park, which originally was a, used for an ice skating rink. There were even some basketball courts way back and some uh, lamp, lamp poles as well. Well, the ice skating rink went away a long time ago, and recently, probably for the last six to ten years it's been used to store uh, snow probably from the business district uh, we came up with an idea because there were a few on council that said why don't you come up with an idea on what we could possibly do so we formed a, the environmental commission formed a subcommittee chaired by Pedro del vecchio and uh, a few residents a few people that wish to be on it a few people from the environmental commission volunteered to sit down over a course of about two or three meetings and come up with some ideas. So tonight, Pedro will make a presentation on what the Environmental Commission and her subcommittee has for this area if possible. Pedro? Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm Pedro Del Vecchio, and I put together a little slideshow, hopefully, uh, We'll give everyone a little insight into the area we're talking about. Many of you are familiar with Stide Park, but we're going to take you through it just for those who aren't. Um, Stide Park is a quiet park in the remote corner of Hackensack. 
It's at the north end of Summit Ave between Coles Brook, uh, or on Coles Brook between Coles Avenue and Davis Avenue. And it shares its border with Maywood and Paramus. So a little background I dug up about Philip Stibe, for whom the park is named. Um, so Philip Stibe was a significant Hackensackian, if I can call him that, um, who lived here from 1900 until he died in uh, 1949. He lived at 117 Clinton Place, which the house is still standing there. I looked it up. Um, and he served as president of the Board of Ed. He was on the Rotary, the president of the Rotary Club, president of the Elks, president of the Orientani Field Club, and the Amphion Glee Club. Um, he was the chairman of the Hackensack Hospital and the Red Cross, and he helped to found the Bergen Pines County Hospital. Uh, significantly, he was one of the co-founders of the YMCA, and uh, most people in the city credited him with that building that we have there for the Y. So um, Stibe Park was named in his honor. So just a little background for Mr. Stibe, um, which is often mispronounced, I guess, by out-of-towners or <laughs> newcomers. Um, so the park consists of a playground. There's a restroom area which is slated for reservation, uh, renovation and improvement under the Green Acres grant. There's a baseball field and a basketball court. You can see them in the slide. Um, restoration of the basketball court is also slated to be improved during the Green Acres project. So as Gary mentioned, during the spring of 2019 and into the summer, there was talk about a dog park and there was quite a bit of uh, pushback from the community though I know some still want it, but um, it seems that it, that's not the way to go with this particular area. Um, my understanding was that about $35,000 worth of the Green Anchors grant money had been designated for the dog park. So, you know, we saw that possibly being available. So this is an um, overhead view of the park, so you can see, and the area we're talking about is the paved area up in the upper left area. It's a, it's a fairly big size. It's about 100 by 200 feet. Um, additionally, there's that grassy area um, to the left on the screen, which is another 50 by 100. So the whole area we're talking about is over a half an acre. Um, so it was, it was used for ice skating for quite a while and hasn't been in quite a while. There's a storm drain in the middle of it. And um, as we know, it sits right on Coles Brook. So there was the old ice skating days that I borrowed from the Hackensack website. Um, so it's used now to store snow. And I know that is a concern and, oop, I'm going too fast. That's a concern as to uh, how that will be dealt with. Let me just back up a little bit. Okay. Uh, so, there's a problem with the storing of the snow on this area. And the problem is that salt and debris washes right into the brook as the snow melts. Um, so just, just more perspective on the thing, there's on the park, there's the brook, which right now looks a little, it's, it's hidden. It's not really, it's underappreciated, let's say. So there's a gate there. Usually it's closed. This particular day that I was taking these pictures, it was open facing towards Maywood. You can see there's some remnants of, I don't know, light poles and things. And from the far end, there's a turnaround at the end of Davis Avenue. So this is looking east towards where the playground would be. So it's a large area. So I found this significant that um, this area collects a lot of rainfall, rainwater. And this picture was taken a week after the last rain, rainstorm had fallen. So it's collecting water, and the water just sits there. It's a breeding ground for mosquitoes. Um, so it's not a great use of the land. Also, in recent years, we've had some serious flooding at the bottom of Coles Brook, where it goes under uh, Main Street, where Route 4 exits. So this is from Hurricane Irene, and that was a disaster. And another one here from just a fairly typical April spring storm where that area was all flooded near uh, between Coles and South Lake Drive. So one of the things we want, we thought about this is that planting more trees in this area, there's where the snow is stored, um, would absorb some of that water that flows downstream. Now, I can't say that would prevent any flooding, but it would decrease some of it because in a big storm, the, water, the trees soak up quite a bit of the water. 
So our, our first big request is that the pavement be removed from Stive Park. And that's probably our biggest request. The rest of the project I think you'll find is not terribly costly. It involves a lot of volunteer hours, which we have a lot of volunteers interested. Um, so removing this pavement would be the first obstacle. Um, so as I said, dumping the snow is a problem there because the snow s just stays sitting on the pavement. As it melts, there's just a drain, a small drain for it to flow through. And there's ice on that drain. So nothing's flowing through until it all melts and it takes the entire winter. Whereas putting that snow on a permeable surface, grass, the parking lot, like I know in Fashini, it's a gravel parking lot mainly, um, that allows every melt uh, some of the water to be absorbed and percolate away. It also filters out salts and other toxins that are in that uh, snow. So, you know, I found this guideline from the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, the Division of Water Quality, and their guidelines for disposing of snow is that you should locate something um, near pervious surfaces in upland areas away from water resources and wells. So that's kind of where wrong on two counts. We're in an impervious surface right next to a tributary of the Hackensack River. So the snow melt can filter into the soil, leaving behind sand and debris, which can be removed in the springtime. So the cleanup would be better after this. Um, following areas must be avoided, according to the Department of, Ed of Environmental Protection. Any water body, including rivers, the ocean, reservoirs, ponds, or wetlands. And I know we don't dump directly into the water, but the next one is storm ca drain catch basins or stormwater drainage swells or ditches. Snow combined with sand and debris may block a storm drainage system causing localized flooding. High volume of sand, sediment, and litter released into melting snow may also may be quickly transported through the system into surface water. So we have all these problems. This is all going right into the brook. Um, this is a picture looking toward the uh, I guess it would be Paramus, possibly River Edge side, but we have a similar drain coming out. So it's basically the water melts, goes through this drain, and right out into the brook. So um, let's see, we talked about, oh. So this area here is actually just as viable for dumping snow. In the winter, it's not used. It's a good sized space between the baseball field and the fence where the parking lot is. And in that space, the snow would melt more quickly, and again, it would uh, filter out some of the toxins, and in the spring, it would be raked up, and there would be nowhere near as much litter going into the brook. So here we have the site as it looks now, and let me just make sure I'm not missing any of my points here. <laughs> and this is sort of, if you can use your imagination and bear with, with me with this, how it would look after. So we just thought that would look quite a bit nicer and be a much nicer use of this area. So we are proposing the creation of the Coles Brook Serenity Garden in the northwest corner of Stye Park. Here you see a path that was laid out by a resident and is used somewhat by people walking through, walking their dogs, just walking for nature. And, and as you may know, there's a significant size wooded area there already. Um, so it's sort of a little piece of forest in Hackensack, which is nice. Um, and we would like to expand this idea to the half acre that we're talking about to make sort of a woodland garden. And we think it's a, time, it's a good time for this because we have that Green Acres grant and the funds that were allocated for the dog park could offset some of the costs of this, mainly, as I said before, the removal of the pavement. So I'm envisioning something somewhat like this. We all drew pictures on our committee and we came up with remarkably similar plans. We all really liked the idea of having a very wooded area with a lot of natural um, native plantings along this side. Why am I going backwards? Wrong place. Okay, so as I mentioned when we were looking at the overhead view that this area here could also be included into the plan. Here's some other pictures of ideas with a permeable path walking through it. Um, I really like the, the left side because it shows our vision, which is that the trees would be 
large shade trees, it would be easy to see through. So while it would be wooded, it wouldn't be closed in. It wouldn't be forest-like. It would be more open. So also due to need for patrols and safety, um, we talked about having low voltage solar lighting throughout, just so it's easy to patrol when the police drive by. But as I said, there's already a forest there and doesn't seem to have too many problems. I could be wrong about that. Um, so the area that we're discussing from this map, if you look closely, it's a little bit obscured, um, is part of a riparian zone. The riparian zone of Coles Brook is the area that where the water meets the land. And it's considered a priority land for water quality protection because of the way it drains into the Hackensack River, which we know the Hackensack River Keeper has been working very hard to clean up the Hackensack River. Um, so the Hackensack River Keeper has actually already designated this as a place for a restoration project along the stream banks to restore native non-invasive species. Right now there's quite a few invasive species and not nearly enough native species. So this would create a buffer and prevent litter and pollution runoff. So this sign is actually posted in Stive Park. It was obscured by a lot of invasive species. <laughs> so um, the Riverkeeper has already expressed their support of this project and have been talking with us about it and encouraging us on it. So the part of the riparian zone that's closest to the brook is fairly barren. You can see where the roots are exposed on these trees. That shouldn't happen if there were um, a better protection against erosion from the runoff. So we would like to restore that. And here are some of the invasives. We have some uh, Norway maples, which kind of prevent anything else from growing, and lots of poison ivy, lots of poison ivy in there. So we'd like to see all that removed and have, vo again, volunteers to do it. As I mentioned before, the Riverkeeper is partnering with us on this, and they've already offered their support with volunteers and grant writing opportunities. So we envision this being a real community project. Um, we've already looked at some of the grants that are available for the project. The Nature Conservancy, along with Sustainable New Jersey, are offering a $20,000 grant for the purchase of trees and woody shrubs to reforest floodplains, just like the one at Stive Park. The New Jersey Urban for uh, and excuse me, the New Jersey Urban and Community Forestry Program offers a grant of up to $30,000 for the purposes of small-scale reforestation on publicly owned land. So there's a lot of incentives for this. Um, additionally, we plan to raise some funds by having trees for purchase for donations in honor of people or dedicated to people throughout the woodland garden, as well as benches. So we've seen that those types of projects done elsewhere where people will donate a certain amount above the cost of the tree or above the cost of the bench to have an honorary plaque placed on it. So ultimately, We'd like something more like this, as opposed to our original picture with the pavement and the dirty snow. So um, we definitely hope you'll consider this project. One note that I'm just gonna leave with you, as far as going back a little bit to the snow issue, you may be very familiar with this, it's new to me, but there are snow melters available and they're costly. And I have some information on them because there's a lot of, data that shows that they save money in the long run over paying overtime for uh, DPW workers to haul the snow over the cost of the dump trucks and the fuel for that. Um, also, it's often, often times what people will do is partner with other groups. So whether with another town to buy this snow melter or with say the shops at Riverside or the Hackensack Medical Center, there's other groups around who may really like to have a snow melter which would just remove any need for storing snow. So I have that information here, just in case you want to take a look at that. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to take a two-minute recess? You guys get okay. set up. I'm going to open to the public just for this discussion only because um, I know there's people here that want to speak. We'll take a two-minute recess and then uh, start over.
All right, so I need a motion to open to the public, please. Author. All in favor? Aye. Aye, none opposed, all right. Anybody who'd like to speak on this subject, please come. Just 30 seconds, Mayor. I mm -hmm. just handed out to the council uh, an issue that, a solution that could be helpful in, in all our parks and along Main Street. It's a uh, huge snow melting machine. There's different sizes. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's towable, it's on a trailer. Uh, this particular one that I found online today, it's a, I, I think it's probably like a relatively middle, middle of the road machine. Uh, 30 tons of ice an hour, they claim that it melts. That's a lot of water going down the drain, okay? And something like this could maybe eliminate two of the time it takes to fill dump trucks and take them to, away from Main Street and the business district, where you could move this maybe along Main Street and just use a bucket loader to keep dumping up the snow in. And uh, so I think a cost savings along that time, but the numbers would have to be worked out naturally. It's just an idea, like I said, I found it. But New York City has 30 of these machines. And in the Englewood, five Englewood uses these. I've Englewood seen, does I've seen it as well? I've seen them in Englewood. It's I don't know whether know. it was a temporary thing when we had a big storm, but yeah. that was at the theater and they actually had them. Yeah, but I think, I think we could, if we did go this route, we could probably uh, rent it out, maybe go partners with another community. Maybe the school system could use it for some critical areas where the snow gets in the way. But please study it, and I'm quite sure DPW mm -hmm. has investigated this already. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Roz Altman, and I live in Hackensack. And I just joined the Environmental Commission about a year ago, and I want to say I really enjoy it. I was I was part of the Hackensack Community Garden, and I enjoyed that, and I love the enthusiasm in that committee, and I think we can bring it to our our whole city to Hackensack. Um, I think their commitment to keep green space and Green space in Hackensack is very important. I visited State Park and I saw it and I thought, said, gee, what a beautiful park, right in the middle that I didn't even know existed. And there are a lot of little par parks around Hackensack that I didn't know and I'm starting right. to visit them. And I think it's so important that we keep this space and preserve it because there is a lot of construction going on in Hackensack and I think that's great because there's growth. But I think we also have to keep our eye on parks and nature trails where people can go and relax and get away from stress which we have a lot of so i hope you really consider um envisioning this or continuing this uh, program to keep our parks and thank you for listening to me thank you ma'am next please good evening annette jankowski 344 prospect avenue um, I'm here representing the Condo Co-op Advisory Board to say that we are very much in favor of this concept at Stuy Park with the Serenity Garden. It would be an environmental and a wellness issue, and I think it would be welcomed by, by the community. Um, in keeping with that, one of the um, agenda items that... Um, the, no, the the proposed project at 289 Prospect Avenue, also the, the Condo Co-op Advisory Board would be very supportive of some sort of park on that property at 289 Prospect. It would be, a, I think, a welcome addition. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Ladies, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen of the uh, City Council, Mayor John Labros. How are you, And Joseph? everyone here. We're gathered here in the forest canopy, what was once a forest canopy, of the Great Eastern Rainforest until about a few hundred years ago. But we have the opportunity to replace the forest canopy, at least a half acre, up at Stuy Park. So I'm privileged to be part of the committee. Pedro, thank you again. You did a marvelous job. And we've been working on this, and hopefully we'll have a, another beautiful community park that uh, we may not have had up to par before. But this is marvelous. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Eric Martindale, I live in Maywood, originally from Hackensack. 
um, generally supported this project. I think it's a good idea. And uh, I had originally suggested to Pedra about making a small wetland area along the stream where flood water could, could flood in during storms. But after seeing the presentation, I'm thinking that a small pond along the stream, maybe something even, not even the size of this room, but a little small pond, and I would add to the visual appeal of it, there could be some benches where people could sit there and look at it. And again, I would be somewhere where the floodwaters could actually uh, go, actually reducing the volume uh, downstream. So I would like the um, mayor and council to consider that. Another idea, I don't know how feasible it is, um, in terms of disposing of the asphalt, maybe it would be better to just dig up the asphalt and make a mound of it on some part of this Serenity Garden, cover it with two feet of dirt, and then you don't have to pay to get rid of the asphalt. And I would make a nice little, again, adding to the diversity of the terrain there, you can maybe mound it up and just a thought, not even sure if I'm in favor of it, but I'm just throwing it out there as a possibility. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Kathleen Savo. Um, that was an excellent presentation, Paige, and everybody did their homework so well. A um, couple of good things I heard tonight. That melter thing sounds really good because I, you know, having been in Canada, that's what they do. They don't take the snow, put it on a corner, then pick it up and whatever. It goes from the the property to the truck, and it's it's less movement, and it and it would save a lot of time. And it would be a great a great idea. Um, the preservation of of the land would be nice. Eric's idea is good. You can call it a, a rock garden or an asphalt, what do we call it, an asphalt garden, <laughs> if you pile the rocks up. Or maybe use it as a barrier to stop the water from coming, because when it floods, it does flood. It will, will come up into the land. Just a couple of things, and I don't want to be negative, but having worked in all the parks, we have to be careful of vandalism, and we have to also be careful of safety. Most of our, all of our parks and all of our, our public land uh, is visual when, when when police officer passes, they can see everything that's going on. And I started, I did this in 1996 when um, Leo and I were on the recreation board. It, w it took me two years, but we did it with volunteers and, um, and and whatever. And I filled like six dumpsters with junk and and stuff in it, and it was it was very dangerous. So that park, like all our parks, have lights in them, and where a police officer can pass and see if there's anything going on because safety is, is our utmost concern. And vandalism is terrible in, ha in Hackensack. Um, Columbus Park, we have play equipment, they climb the gazebo, they climb the statue. And uh, David's Park and the Carver Park, the water fountain gets broken. And, and kids just, just, people just destroy things. It's not only, it's so, and not only kids, it's grown ups do it too. So keeping all these little things in mind, I mean, don't get too fussy, because you're gonna have these beautiful gardens and somebody's gonna trample on it, and you're gonna be heartbroken. So it has to be done with the way it could be abused, and, and that's going to be like a, a challenge. But it's, it's an excellent idea, and I think it's a good, thing, good project. Thank you. Next, please. Good evening. Mike Allegretta, 215 Davis Avenue. So with the uh, construction that's going on in the city, which is a great thing, um, I'd love to see tower cranes and, and the apartments and uh, bettering Main, Main Street. Finally, things are happening, and Mayor and Council, you guys had a lot to do with that. So on the other hand, um, this Serenity Park, which is being discussed, just it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, uh, benefit me for sure. I live on the end of Davis Avenue, but each year, I guess once they stopped icing the, uh, the rink, the city started using that for overflow of snow. Yeah, I get it, but it's never maintained. I sent photos out. Um, we have snow there until April. Not only that, the garbage, the debris, bumpers, household debris, you know, people walk that park. It's, it's a great park. You know, once the spring comes around, you know things are happening. 
people are walking, they walk their dogs. It's it's a great area of town, and, and we're lucky to have that. So, you know, what we're talking about right here, it's just going to make Hackensack that much better for, for all the good that's been going on over the last couple of years with the mayor and council. Really need to listen to what we want to do down there, and I think it would just benefit the city because good things are happening here. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And if you, excuse me, if you do uh, use the park again, it's got to be maintained for snow. It, you know, I sent out pictures last year. It, it, it's bad. And a lot of people walk their dogs down there, and it's, it's actually not safe. Okay. Anybody else from the public? Seeing none, motion to close to the public. Offer. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. All right. If you folks want to stay for the rest of the meeting, you're more than welcome. Otherwise, we'll take a one minute recess while you clear out. It's up to you. I guess we could do our public comments now on this, if you'd like. Sure. All right. We'll do that. Okay. Stephanie? Um, thank you to the Environmental Commission for um, presenting and coming out tonight. Um, you know, I think it's a wonderful idea. Um, I think this council has shown a lot of support for the different um, environmental initiatives that are going on from the community garden. Um, we still have the greenhouse, um, you know, everyone's working on. I think it would be a great thing. Um, there are some logistics that, you know, that I just want to address to make sure that, you know, this is something that is not gonna come back and um, be an issue. Um, in regards to tearing up the asphalt, God forbid there was something that was found, an environmental issue or something. What are the next steps then? Then we can't just plant, we have to do something, some type of remediation. I'm anticipating that nothing is there, but if there is, I, I, I think we have to plan accordingly for that. Um, parking, you know, just to ensure that there's enough parking spaces. Um, one of the goals is to increase the usage of the park. Um, so making sure that those parking spaces that are leading down to that lotted area, there's enough to accommodate different, you know, um, the rec program, different games and things that are going on at Stibe. Um, and then as Ms. Salvo said, the security, um, you know, I, I, the pictures are absolutely beautiful and I think it's, you know, a great idea. We do not have anything like that in Hackensack. Um, and I think it would be a great, um, you know, addition to all the different projects we have going on, we don't have something like a serenity garden where people would go quietly um, and sit and, you know, do different things. So I think it's going to be wonderful, but maybe looking at um, how, you know, overgrown those trees will get to, you know, prevent security issues. Because right now when you pull in there, you can kind of gauge, you know, what's going on in the different wooded areas. So um, I think if we could figure out those types of things and make sure that, um, those are all, you know, doable and acceptable. I, I wouldn't be on board for the um, snow in the grass area that um, you suggested, Ms. Del Vecchio, just because I know when baseball season starts, there's still a lot of melting snow. So I think that's going to be an issue for that field and um, spectators there. But if we could figure out something else with the snow, um, I think it's a good thing. But, you know, thank you for, you know, all your hard work. And I think it's, you know, it's a good idea. Thank you. Thanks, Steph. <clears throat> Again, I'd like to thank the Environmental Committee for, you know, putting their noses to the ground, so to speak, and coming up with uh, a, a really lovely plan. And, and Pedro, you did a wonderful job of presenting that, and very clear and, you know, very focused, and we appreciate that. I mean, I think it's a wonderful idea. I mean, I don't like the looks of it. I agree with Mr. Allegretta, you know, that there's times of the year when it's really an eyesore, and it shouldn't be. And I love the fact that we're getting good, positive feedback from the community of what they would like to see there, because it's important. It's important to us to have that kind of feedback, what makes sense and what types of things would really be appreciated and be used if the city is going to invest in it. I mean, as you, as you referred, you know, the most important issue here is snow management. I mean, you know, that's our problem. And it's not just a problem in Stuy Park, it's a problem throughout the city. And it's something that we have to address and before we could go forward with this plan. I certainly love the sounds of this snow melter. Um, I think these are things we can look into. And I ask you folks to continue to work on other options. You know, you, you seem to really work well together and come up with good ideas. You know, let's push it a little further and let's think about what really makes the most sense for managing the snow 
so that it, it isn't a costly thing for the city and it doesn't have to be moved terribly far. You know, when we, we have it strategically placed throughout the city, how do we do this so that we can accomplish something like this? Uh, I know John, the mayor said that you folks might leave after this, but as far as the environmental committee goes, I'm gonna just give a short debrief because we had, uh, I, I'm the city's liaison to the advisory committee at Teterboro Airport. Noise, again, is a big environmental issue. And I'm gonna just give a little update on that. And so perhaps some of you might wanna to stay to hear that. And I'd love to have some partners and some, some support from the environmental committee there too. I have a lot of support from the folks that live on Prospect and the condos, because they're uh, in a huge, huge impact to some of their quality of life from, from the flight path that goes right over Prospect. But it also goes over a lot of other areas in Hackensack as well. So I'm always looking for people to join the fight with me. So you might wanna to stay to hear updates on that. Thank you. Dave? I think it's a great idea. I just want to do more of my own homework. I want to thank the Environmental Committee for a great presentation. And I'll get back to you. Thank you. Leo? Well, yeah, like the rest of the council, I think it's a good idea. I got knowledge about this non melter. I saw one in action in New York City and really were wonderful. And we just continue working together. Uh, I think we can accomplish what you guys want. Thank you. Okay. First of all, I want to thank the committee. Great job. Pedro, great job. Um, I love the ambition. And uh, you just jump from one project to another. Nothing's going to, you know, <laughs> moving forward. And uh, that's how things get done in this city. So I like that. Um, no, I'm in. But, you know, there's, like uh, Councilwoman von Rundborg said, there's some logistics the city has to figure out. You guys have done your work, now it's our turn to do our work. We have to figure out what we need to do to get this done. And that, that works for everything that's involved, the snow, the fields, um, <clears throat> you know, making sure there's no remediation. The remediation is a fear I have over there as well because we don't know what's under that asphalt, hopefully nothing. But uh, cer certainly something we'd have to do. We'd certainly have to have it tested, I would think, before we move forward, at least. But uh, now it's our turn. Um, I already know that our city manager has already got gears turning on this, as, on what to do with the snow. The thing that miffs me, and Eric, you'll probably appreciate this, and you know, all our storm, where we're not combined sewers in the city, all our storm sewers run directly to the Hackensack River, or in some cases, Coles Brook, all right? So no matter where snow is with salt on it, when it melts, it's going into the river. So to me, uh, you know, I'm like, yeah, it makes no sense that we couldn't store the Fashini, but we can melt it somewhere else and put it into the river. It, and if you had that machine, for instance, that's going to go into a storm sewer, and it's going to go right into the, correct me if I'm wrong, into the river, right? Because mm -hmm. where else? You're not, certainly not going to put it in your combined sewer because you're going to pay to treat it. So that's the last thing you would want. But uh, I, I still... As far as the DEP is concerned, I don't understand that whole process. Uh, maybe it's the way it's distributed into the rivers is differently. It's, but uh, you're, it's all going into major pipes right into the river, um, which is brackish water to begin with. But so is the oils off the road and everything else that goes into our storm sewers. So that's an environmental issue unto itself. But uh, we're going to reach out to the DEP and ask for some ideas and what their recommendations are. So um, we will keep in touch. Obviously, Gary's going to be in touch, and we'll start moving forward, and putting, you know, doing our homework now. So we appreciate the presentation, and uh, it would be a great addition to the park. And I agree. I've been uh, over by Mike Gallagher's house in the winter time when that snow is starting to melt, and all you, know, you find all kinds of crazy things in that snow over there because it's you know it gets swept up with the plows dumped into a dump truck and then dumped over there. So it's really kind of unsightly, so I totally agree with that. It's a misuse of that, but let us get to work now. So thank you again for the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, do, you, do you want to do... Uh, well, let me go next in case the, the folks want to leave. Okay, for, the, for those of you that don't know, um, Teterboro has uh, a committee it's called the TANET Committee, which is the Teterboro Aircraft Noise Abatement Committee. And a lot of what they do is look at the impact that the noise of, of uh, air traffic in the area and how it impacts quality of life. 
and we have been fighting this, oh, way before I became involved, it, way longer, more than 10 years to try and get the flight path moved from the path it currently takes right over almost the entire Hackensack and most directly flies right over at a low, lower altitude, right over Prospect Ave with a lot of the apartment buildings being the height that they are and the, the medical center where, you know, you say be quiet hospital zone and then you're putting jets within 50 feet of their roof. Like it really kind of doesn't make sense. So I've been, you know, very, very heavily involved in having that flight path moved and having that flight path moved to follow Route 17. So it would just be a short, um, it would just be a short move west but it would take it away from a lot of the Hackensack area and especially the high altitude of Summit Avenue, which is, you know, or Prospect and Summit, which is very prominent. And we've made wonderful progress and I'll report on that later. But first I wanna start by saying congratulations, Hackensack, right? I've been asking folks in Hackensack, see something, say something. When you see a low flying plane, when you hear a noise, please call the number and log that complaint because you hate to say the squeaky wheel gets the grease, but it does. And that's the one thing that the airport and the FAA look at, is how many, they look at two things, what's the number of complaints I get and what's the number of people that complain. So they're not so thrilled if, you know, they have 100 complaints, but they're all by two people. Right? They, wanna, they wanna look and understand both. So my, my goal was always to beat Rutherford, okay? Because Rutherford always had 300 and something complaints and we would barely maybe get 120. We beat Rutherford! <laughs> And it's only, it was only October when we had the meeting. So I was like jumping out of my skin. I was so excited. So Rutherford had, Rutherford had 358 calls logged and we Hackensack had 365. So it's a close race, but we logged more than Rutherford because of course they're getting the aircraft that's coming in another direction. But the most important thing, and I'll tell you, everyone there and at that committee was very impressed with Hackensack because even Rutherford who has their 358 complaints they're only by 45 people, so the number of people, and, and they, they were the highest. Most people have 10 or 20, you know, they're not even anywhere near approaching 45. Of our 365 complaints, they were by 250 people. So yay Hackensack, okay? I asked for some support, you guys came out, made those phone calls, now don't give up. Right? Keep making those phone making calls because that's what gets their attention and that's what's going to get action for us. So I was very, very, very excited to hear that and see that. Uh, all right, other than that, if you're looking since January of 2019, the airport considers an event any flyover. So whether it's a takeoff or an arrival, it's called an event. And the louder the events, of course, the more disturbing they are to us. Normally, what the FAA and what the airport in general looks at is they average these things out. So they're averaging the noise levels even when nothing's flying. Okay, so then the number looks a little lower and makes everybody feel a little happier. Well, I, I had been asking them that I want to see the real number. I want to see how many events are flying over, over our city at a higher decibel rate. Like to them, 65 is the number, right? Anything over 65 decibels is annoying or shouldn't really be happening for any extended period of time. Well, in Hackensack, there were 16,828 events since January that had decibel ranges between 79 and 82. So now think about that, right? So all of this folks telling us, oh, it's your imagination, that's not really happening. We are in, of all of the communities in this area, we are by far the most impacted by the air traffic. So we're not gonna give up this fight. We're gonna keep logging and environmental committee folks jump on board with me. Cause sometimes I'm out there all alone fighting this. Although I'm a good fighter if those of you that know me. Uh, next thing that's gonna be happening is this flight path was supposed to be released in 2019, but the new date was pushed forward to uh, the end of March, 2020. So it's close. So they, the FAA came to our last meeting and gave us a debriefing. What happens now is they have to include a 30-day public review and comment period. So the number they have now, the date they have now is January 8th, 2020. I'm gonna report that repeatedly as meetings go on. They're gonna have a public workshop. So this is where folks can go, can learn, and can again voice their concerns. They have to have feedback as to what's gonna happen. So I wanna have quite a few Hackensack folks coming out and, and definitely voicing their concerns. The good news is they're still on target for this March date. Do I 100% believe it's gonna happen in March? It's been postponed already. You know, I, I'm, I'm not gonna say 
yay, I'm, I'm sure it's going to happen. But I'm optimistic because the study was just about complete. It had to do two levels of environmental testing, and that is pretty much being finalized now. So again, this will be an alternate flight path. It can't be used in bad weather, but we'll take any relief that we can at this point in time. So again, see something, say something. Thank you, Hackensack residents, for making those phone calls. Thank you, guys. So we're going to move on to this number two. Move on to number three, please. Yes, sir. <clears throat> uh, number three on the agenda tonight is the NJDOT Route 80 project. Uh, this project involves, uh, requires uh, the city to construct new facilities of existing water and sewer systems or require the city to pro protect, relocate, or adjust existing facilities um, for their systems. Basically, the state DOT is going to repave and do some issues as far as drainage. Uh, the NJDOT recognizes the city is not obligated by state law or agreement to pay for certain costs that the city may incur as the result of this project. And then the next whereas is, which sets forth understanding for the verification, design, protection, and relocation of city water, sewer, facilities in connection with the design and construction of the project. So they're going to come in, essentially fix their problems and hopefully not complicate ours. And this is a um, supporting resolution set forth for this project. I mean, I, I might just comment on that. I mean, uh, I've been in contact with NJDOT on this. Um, and essentially, because they're going to be repaving portions of Route 80, um, it may require them like with manholes and things that are in that area, you know, on the off ramps, for example, that may have to be addressed, reconstructed. We don't pay for any of that the, because it's a state project. The state will pay for it. Um, what this agreement's going to do is, you know, because it's our infrastructure and I'm told we don't really have a lot of infrastructure actually in the area where they're going to do this. But for example, we are going to have to have our engineers work with NJDOT and it wouldn't be appropriate for the taxpayers of Hackensack to pay for those costs when it's the state doing this project. So this agreement will allow us to um, have those costs reimbursed by the state. State will do all the actual construction, um, but there are various agreements that we need to enter into, you know, because they're getting funding from the federal government, all sorts of stuff. Um, so the state's asked us to approve this agreement for that purpose. One thing I want to make sure of, because when Route 80 was constructed originally back in, I guess in the 60s, um, that's when the, the, we have something called the Riser Ditch, which comes down up from Carlstadt along Route 17. When they were done with the Route 80 project, it was Riser Ditch issues, which have contributed to flooding issues over Newman and Lodi, that whole area. And uh, I just want to make sure. Well, well, the, like well, the, well the, the, the city is required to designate uh, points of contact. I think we're using Ryan, Westra, and I forget who, maybe one other person, mm -hmm. and Susan Banzen, who are going to be our city points of contact. So I would recommend the city manager, you know, communicate with them and make sure any issues that you want addressed to the extent this project is going to implicate any of that stuff um, because. Um, you know, we are going to be working with them in terms of developing the plans. Um, that's part of the agreement that, that it's supposed to be, uh, uh, you know, a collective effort to make sure that the city's infrastructure is not negatively impacted by whatever it is NJDOT's done. So they'll be in a position to work with the project manager at NJDOT. And quite frankly, I don't even have the time frame as to when they're going to actually move forward with this. Uh, anyway, you know, they, they, it looks like they're just, I guess, trying to get all these agreements in place because obviously they have to get, you know, Rochelle Park, you know, all the neighboring towns where right. Route 80 might go over. I guess when they get all of that paperwork done, then they'll probably start having project meetings and figuring out, you know, what actually needs to be done in order to accomplish the project. I have a couple of questions or a couple of issues. Uh, again, you know, with the sewer work going on in the city, I don't know if that area is sewer separated or combined. 
but you know, if they're doing um, drainage work and looking at manholes and catch basins or sewer issues, we want to make sure that while they're doing this, everything at least is clearly delineated and documented so that when we do get to separating that particular port, or if anything they can do to help remediate any flooding in that area at this time, whether it be, you know, maybe putting box culverts in where it, it accumulates water and releases it slowly uh, during storm events. If there was any way we could get some of that work accomplished at the same time, that would be wonderful for us. And I know it's a stretch, but we talk all the time about the nightmare of Route 80 and Paul Fly Road and what it does to our traffic. And, you know, we've had folks come and speak on this. We've looked into this. There's nothing we can do because NJDOT has to do it. But, hey, while they're working on Route 80, let's revisit this again. What can we do to fix that configuration? You know, the problem really is cutting over to Route 17. Most of the folks are coming off of 80 to get to Route 17. And while you're doing this work, maybe now's the time to try and fix some of these things. Or maybe prevent some of these lefts. Or, you know, maybe don't, don't have an entrance onto Route 80 there. Go down, to, uh, go down a block or two to Green Street and, and stop some of this. There has to be a way to fix this problem. Anyone that's been on Powerfly Road, Four or five o'clock in the afternoon knows it's dead stop. It's horrible. And um, let's bring this up while, while this is going on and see what we can, see what we can do. Apply some more pressure. We certainly will. I mean, uh, you know, where, how NGDOT will respond, you know, we'll let you know if they uh, respond positively to that. But I think we can certainly impress that upon them that this issue needs to be addressed. Yeah, I mean, that configuration, whoever came up with that, that there was no direct access to 17 was just very foolish. So let's see what we could do. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> if there's no other on. questions, we'll move on to um, the Oprah Act. Um, we have a supporting resolution from the borough of Hawthorne, and hopefully if this passes muster with our council, we would then ask to have an, an additional supporting resolution from the city of Hackensack. And this is basically the context of OPA request. Um, the borough of Hawthorne has labored under a well-intended law has spired out of control due to the volume and nature and request cost to the taxpayer in responding to requests and the potential liability to having pay disproportionate prevailing party attorney fees should requests turn into litigation matters as well as liability in determining which documents shall be released with or without redacting while attempting to maintain individual privacy. Debbie, tell the Mayor and Council how many open requests we've had in 2019, please. We're up to 1,000. Okay. 1, so the city has already had to hire part time help to address over 1,000 open requests. These documents um, we have to require when requested to supply them, but we don't have to make documents for people. If we have them on file, um, we are required to supply them with the proper request form and notification. This whole thing is turned in, in my opinion, a cottage business for certain law firms and attorneys because you missed it by the delay. You, it, you had 10 days. We didn't get it. We didn't this and that. And the truth is we just waste all this time and taxpayer money looking this document up or making copies of it and we get into this whole thing. So. If the support of the mayor and council are there, I would strongly suggest that we have our city attorney prepare a similar resolution supporting that we need to put some controls in place in this open request because that thing is run off the runway here and where it just galloped into a completely different direction that was never the intent of it. And it was well intended in the beginning because we want to be transparent, but it's taken on a life of its own. And, and if I might add a couple comments, um, you know, first of all, um, you know, in terms of um, legal time, right, you know, my office spends a good portion of, of the time that we have available in a month to dealing with, you know, the more complex OPA requests, the ones that require, you know, legal review and redaction. So it's definitely an issue. I would also remind this council that uh, while I was here, I can't remember exactly when, you know, we did pass a resolution expressing some concern because there is ongoing legislation to make OPRA and the Open Public Meetings Act um, 
even more unfriendly to municipal governments. Um, you know, I, I've had conversations personally with uh, State Senator Weinberg about this issue because of the, the impact it's having on, on municipalities. So I am aware uh, that legislation remains open. You know, we are in a lame duck session uh, with the legislature where all sorts of things can get passed, uh, whether they make sense or they don't make sense. And, and this resolution kind of arises uh, from that, where a lot of municipalities are trying to you know, remind the legislature, hey, you know, let's not do this in a one-sided way. Access to public records is important, and we all support that. But let's not go to the point that, you know, it's completely unwieldy and untenable for municipalities to continue to do what they're doing. And, and certainly I know the clerk and I talk about open requests probably every single day. Um, so just so you understand the genesis that a lot of towns are, are looking at this and trying to say, hey, look, you know, let's really look at this issue. Let's provide access. But, you know, those people who are filing, and this, this happens. I mean, I think it happened in Teaneck. Someone was filing 500 plus OPA requests, one person. They went to court, and the court said, well, nothing you can do about it. Um, and so when that sort of thing happens, it, it does become that balance between public access and, um, you know, and, and the impact on the municipality, you know, that balance perhaps gets a little bit out of whack. Could I ask you, uh, I already know the answer, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Are some of these uh, people that are passing or pushing these Oprah things, are different levels, higher levels of government, are they exempt from Oprah themselves? Well, that is correct. I mean, that's one of the issues that okay. uh, has been repeatedly raised by those of us who practice in municipal law is that the legislature carved itself out of Oprah, meaning that... Uh, you know, if, if uh, the legislature itself or any individual legislators receive an OPA request, uh, they are not required to answer it or provide any of their records in any way. Um, you know, th there's also issues we talked about in that respect, like an unfunded mandate as well. I mean, obviously the costs involved are, are tremendous, and it is true that the legislature um, will not uh, apply the same rules to itself that it, it, it mandates on us in the city. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. okay, if there's nothing else, uh, next on the list is the public school closing for elections. Um, once again, we have a um, supporting document from Senate Bill S3846 and Assembly Bill A Adam 5716, which would require public schools to be closed on the days of primary and regular elections. Obviously, schools are a primary location for election spots for because they have the ability to park, they have the gymnasiums, they have lunch rooms, they have large vast rooms that, that basically lend themselves to the ability for, for voting. Um, but then we have the security issue for the students, the school, the conflict, the parking, who's here for with this practice, the disruption that has to the schools. So I think this supporting document is trying to eliminate all of that and try to make the electoral um, process streamlined and clear. I think it's a great idea, and I don't like the fact that uh, with all the issues we have in our schools right now. Yep. Yeah. And Security issues. Some of the craziness that goes on with elections and politics right now, I don't think the two are a good mix. So Years children, ago, it always used to be. I, I remember the schools were always closed on election day. Yeah, they used to be closed. Well, I don't know I guess, why they were Yeah, I don't but, know. Uh, next on the list is the increase of poll workers' pay. Yay. Um, the uh, bill is assembly from Kevin T. Rooney, the primary sponsor of Assembly Bill Adam 5726, which would increase the wage pay to poll workers from $200 to $300 with 225 to be paid to the state of New Jersey and 75 paid to the county w in which the election is being held. That's the number one question I get when I walk into a polling location on election day from every board worker. Are you going to increase my pay? The next question is, where's the coffee and donuts? <laughs> <laughs> we normally offer pepperoni over play. That's the enhancement. Um, next is number seven, 
which is a resolution called 1033 program. This is an annual um, supporting document which allows our police department to take advantage of access excess equipment from the DOD supplies and equipment from the state and local law enforcement agencies from the Secretary of Defense. Basically, um, military equipment that would no longer be useful to the military seems to work out to be quite useful to local law enforcement and municipal government. And without this approving resolution, we have no ability to basically um, American pickers here. Um, scurry this the countryside and see what we can. We have a really nice white Dodge pickup truck that the Traffic Bureau uses that we had to label that we use every day for the Traffic Bureau, move cones, stanchions. Certainly a brand new pickup truck's um, a considerable amount of money. Um, so it's of great value to the city and I support it. We, we've done this in the past mm -hmm. and in other yes, ways sir. and I know uh, Congressman Gottheimer's with his program, it's not 1033, but it's similar. But our guys in the police department, and mostly in the police department, some of the fire department, but on top of yep. getting all this surplus stuff, and it saves the taxpayers money. Right. It saves a lot of money. You add it up at the end of a year, you know, all of a sudden you got, you know, upwards of a half a million dollars worth of equipment they've accrued just by going to these things where for basically a couple hundred dollars, basically. It's almost free. Wish and, they had uh, a snow melter. Yeah, I was thinking of that. What if the uh, military has a snow melter? We could use that. Here's Santa. We got a couple of police cars right there. Hold on. Yep. And tires for the Humvees. And uh, yep. yep, we've we've certainly tried to work that. And I think our some of our officers enjoy doing it as well. It's like a hobby for them. They like doing it, so it's good. Um, that would complete the city manager's report unless Deputy Mayor Castrino has something else to add to or FAA. Otherwise, Perfect. that would okay. be the end of the city manager's report for the Council of the Whole agenda. Thank All you. Right. She didn't want me to do this, but we're going to do it at the next one anyway. We're going to do it now anyway. We just had the League of Municipalities down in uh, Atlantic City where all the elected officials throughout the state go down and uh, there's a lot of... Uh, meetings and there's a lot of classes and there's a lot of uh, networking going on but our very own deputy mayor Kathleen Canestrino was voted one of the five top women in government in the state of New Jersey so uh, it was a well-deserved honor and uh, go ahead, go ahead, she deserves it and uh, you know, Kathy, Kathy's a, as tough as they come I've been in meetings where I, I've laughed because I've seen grown men sweat and and on occasion even cry. And uh, she's tough, she's good at what she does, she doesn't back down, she deals with whoever she needs to deal with. You know, she not only holds down the fort in certain cases, she is the fort in certain cases, especially when it comes to redevelopment. So kudos to you, Deputy Mayor, great job. Oh, thank and, you. I'm uh, looking forward to doing it again later. Thank you very much, <laughs> it, was, it was a real honor. I mean, even, you know, just to be recognized with the other, there, you know, there are five women that are selected throughout the state, I and mean, you think we have 565 municipalities, so it's a true honor. To, uh, to receive such an award. And it's wonderful also, I think, the recognition for the t city of Hackensack. I mean, you know, it certainly, there was a ton of people and, you know, everybody here was, was there cheering me on and it was great and I really appreciated everyone coming. Um, but again, it brought recognition to the city of Hackensack, hearing about our accomplishments and, you know, seeing what we're doing as a city, you know, and making people aware throughout the state. I mean, we have a lot of good press, but it's, it never hurts to have a little more publicity. And, uh, you know, I want to say that it's part of who we are in Hackensack. You know, we are diverse and we're inclusive. Um, we have two out of five women here on our council. And, yeah, maybe we can have all five. But, hey, two out of five, we're doing way better than many of the other municipalities throughout the city, throughout the state, rather. And we have wonderful, wonderful women in working throughout the city, helping us manage the city, keeping us on track, doing the right thing, huge contributors. So again, I, I share this award and I share this success with each and every woman throughout the city and throughout the council uh, because they, they deserve it as much as I do. So again, thanks to everyone for the support and keep on doing what we do. Yep, thank you. You have a motion to open to the public. All for All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody from the public would like to speak? Please come forward, give your name to the clerk. You will have three minutes, thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, John Evans, uh, <clears throat> Lincoln Street in Hackensack. I have an unfortunate secretary uh, to the legacy of Mr. Sy. 
On November 4th, the Metropolitan YMCA of the Oranges announced that the YMCA building on Main Street in Hackensack would be sold and closed within the next 24 months. I'm here to request the City Council's assistance in preventing the closure, which means a loss of jobs and a vital contributor to the quality of life of residents of all ages. The WISE closure will affect 3,000 plus members, 19 full-time employees, 170 part-time seasonal employees, plus countless others who use the facility on a temporary basis. The economics of the sale are clearly compelling. That is monetization of a valuable asset, land, situated in prime real estate and an area undergoing significant development. The November 4 announcement asserted that, quote, short-term maintenance and long-term capital improvements are too <coughs> cost prohibitive. This rationale has been greeted with skepticism by members and employees such as uh, James Maboyo, who's here uh, with me, he's a Hackensack resident who can elaborate on that. The announcement stated that the YMCA had made a, quote, difficult decision to move operations into satellite facilities once the building is sold. The soothing impersonal uh, bureaucraties belies limited options available to members and the disruption of employee lives. The nearest comparable YMCAs are located some distance away in Ridgewood and Secaucus. The only comparable full service facility is the rather pricey Hackensack University Medical Fitness and Wellness Center. I hope the council's keen sense of fair play is attuned to the implication of this alternative site, namely a reduction in competition for the HUMC Fitness Center when the Hackensack Y closes. The optics are not good if a member has no practical alternative to keep up a fitness regimen but to pay higher HUMC fitness center fees. Worse, the sale will abandon and strand those few in our community for whom the monthly membership fee provides a warm and safe place but who have no means of transport. I acknowledge the attractiveness to the city and taxpayers to convert an exempt to a rateable property. However, this must be balanced by the council's off-stated quality of life mission and efforts as well as recognition that the favorable tax treatment is granted because of the benefits provided to the community. That's a quid pro quo I can deal with. I'm asking this council to use its power and influence to help with alternatives which prevent the outright sale. For example, help with a sale and leaseback to provide needed capital financing or condition the sale in such a way that a comparable facility will be built to service the greater Hackensack area before the existing building is closed. Help save our why. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, please. Thank you, John. My name is James Mboya. I'm a proud resident of Hackensack. I have been living here in Hackensack for almost seven years now. There is a very bright light shining in Hackensack. Beautiful. We had a presentation of some of the possibilities that can abound when we take care of some environmental issues. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, and our good friend, the Please City Council. We were recently told that the building is going to be sold. The YMCA is such a wonderful place. We have very rich people come there, not because of the facilities, but because it gives them an opportunity to share with those who don't have something. And then we have people who don't have much. We have homeless people. They come to the Y. The beauty about this is that the land on which the YMCA building was built on, this land, it was donated. It was donated to an institution that's non-profit. It has a non-profit charter. That means that its very existence is to serve the people of Hackensack and the greater bargain community. 
So if the building was to be sold, this would disrupt completely so many lives. So many lives would be disrupted. I'm going to give you a little more time to finish because you're three, you're, you're past So your we're just minutes, requesting you. Today I came here to introduce myself because I believe in this city. I, I came here, I feel, I feel that I belong to the right place. And, and just help us to sort this out. But as a resident of Hackensack, I have a good feeling that we will all share. Thank you. Thank you, James. Appreciate it. Next, please. Good evening, Council. So, uh, my name is Randy Glover, Hackensack. Happy holidays to everyone. Thank and you. then, once again, I'm here to state that I'm the creator and producer of the Main Street Live Concert Series, which was hijacked and now called The Sounds of Summer by the city. Uh, it's confusing to me how hundreds of millions of dollars can be appropriated for redevelopment. Close to a million dollars has been spent on the no-bid contract for the concert on the greens over the years. And again, uh, possibly I'm the only minority vendor, unless there's others that you can tell me about, that has been doing something with the city. So once again, I'm just gonna say to the city, hopefully you can spare Hackensack another lawsuit uh, because although council feels he will prevail, I believe I will prevail. And then uh, Deputy Mayor Sims, uh, since you have been identified by others as the voice and representative for, for the minority community, what are you doing concerning this issue? Also, are you meeting with others in the black, brown, and the community at large concerning this issue and other issues that's concerned, that's confronting the community in general? That's all I have to say. But one thing about the, um, the FOIA request, so council, I'm not sure, but if we can't, or if, it takes an attorney to request them. So basically, are you saying that now people have to subpoena uh, public documents? I don't know what he's referring to. I, I no, they're, I, they're saying that they want to limit access to FOIA requests. I mean, all, all I can say, you know, if I may answer, is you know, any OPA requests, as we, we talked about before, the city receives thousands of OPA requests. Um, we respond to successfully thousands of OPA requests. I don't think anybody has found in the three years that I've been here that we haven't complied with our OPA obligations, I think, in every single instance. <coughs> if you submit a valid OPA request, regardless of whether you have a lawsuit against the city or thinking about a lawsuit with the city or anything else, it will be responded to properly in accordance with the law. You're welcome to do so. But again, you know, not every OPA request is valid. If it's invalid, we'll tell you why and give you an opportunity if you wish to resubmit it. I can't recall what OPA requests you may have sent, or nor I'm would I even speak about, about it personally. specifically at Sorry. this point. So, and when I say OPA, that's the New Jersey version of FOIA, so we understand. Right, exactly. But I wasn't talking about me personally. Yeah. I was just responding to what I heard when they said yeah, to well, limit the OPA. If you submit it, you know, and it's it's proper, we would respond to or anybody else. Okay, thank you. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you. All right, Rick Wilby, Inglewood, New Jersey. Uh, I heard somebody say that Hackensack is diverse and inclusive, and I hope with the demographics of almost 65% uh, combined black and brown, some of these questions can be answered very easily to see if that's true. Number one, what is the total capital investment thus far by the developers into Hackensack? Number two, how many developers are building in Hackensack currently? Number three, how many subcontractors are currently being used in Hackensack? What is the criteria to build in Hackensack? Number four, are there any minority builders developing in Hackensack? Number five, 
are there any minority subcontractors? Number six, are there any minority workers on the sites? If so, do you know how many or percentage of minority workers? Number seven, how much in pilots has Hackensack given to developers? Now, that's a very important question because coming from Inglewood, seeing what's going on in Teaneck and to Hackensack, I don't understand why we have to give pilots to very wealthy developers to give them valuable real estate at the expense of the taxpayers. That's very reprehensible. Number nine, do we currently plan to continue giving developers pilots? If so, why? Number 10, what are the residents of Hackensacks receiving in exchange for all the pilots being given? The gentleman just now spoke about the YMCA and the fact that you guys want to sell the property. I don't know how true that is, but in Inglewood, we're looking for a community center. And we have they, 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 they own it. They own the property. They're so selling it. There's some they're kind of, okay. The city has nothing to do with that. So what kind of concessions are these multi-millionaire developers coming in with these billions and billions of dollars of property that's being developed? And I just, they gave you all these accolades, Kathleen, as being the fort. And you said Hackensack was diverse and inclusive. But I've seen something very funny in a lot of these towns that I go to, and I see these diverse and exclusive claims that people of color are being pushed out, and the gentrification is the new Jim Crow, because you simply can't afford to live in these towns anymore. Okay, and it's very egregious that the price to rent some of these apartments are astronomical and out of the cost. Okay, one third of your salary goes to rent. What are people going to do when they can't afford their rent? Okay, is Hackensack inclusive to low-income people? Is it diverse to low-income people? And I'm not talking about set-asides or affordable housing that's unaffordable. Because sometimes you hear the term affordable housing and a studio starts at $2,500. That's not affordable. All right, so I would like to have some answers to some of these questions. I've been watching it from afar. I noticed that the probation department is being knocked down today. I've been to some county freeholder meetings. They're talking about how they love the veterans. They're not building anything for veterans. And nobody's getting anything besides these wealthy developers. Please answer these concerns. Well, I'm going to answer the one yes. right off the bat about the wealthy developers. Number one, they're business people. Number two, the city of Hackensack downtown has been in decline for over 40 years. Nosedive. Nobody, nobody comes to Hackensack. Nobody wanted to come to Hackensack. There was a stigma about this town that it was the next Patterson. It was the next you know, urban disaster in North Jersey. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, what, what do you see? What big businesses you see? What do you see going on Central before? Avenue. Excuse me. It's my turn. We're not going to go back no, and no, forth. No, you no, had no, your three minutes, right? Yeah. You disparaged this council with your hard work on redevelopment, and that's not right. I'm going to use Ortani Field Club, all right? How much land is there? Do you know? I'll yeah. ask you questions, okay. not off the top of your head. Yeah. It was paying $56,000 a year in taxes, okay? And I use this example all the time. Half the people here are probably tired of hearing it, all right? So where's the developers been for the last 30, 40 years coming to rebuild Hackensack? Where have they been? Without, without pilots, where have they been? Why aren't they come? Why haven't they come? Nobody would come to Hackensack. Nobody would come to Hackensack, all right? The state put the program in, all right? The pilot, payment in lieu of taxes, all right, to give developers incentive because it gives them a certainty of their investment, all right, which they're not going to get paying traditional taxes in a city like Hackensack. What's it going to happen? And the one thing I'll agree with you on as time goes on, pilots will decline. There won't be any need for them. You guys also have the opportunity zone in Hackensack? We have an opportunity. We have two opportunity zones in what Hackensack. What section is that in? Uh, one's over by Newman and Lodi over that way, and the other one's up by Zabriskie Street. But my, my point being, the first, the first day that building opens gets a certificate of occupancy, it pays $700,000 a year. Now, you say we're not helping people, all right? By 2024, we'll be bringing $10 to $12 million in revenue into the city that didn't exist before. Where's that money going to go? To rebuild the city and to offset taxes, all right? How many now, years are the tax abatements? They range from 5 to 30. 30? Five to 30, yeah. And at 30 years, they're fully paid off. They go on a traditional tax base, just like if they were traditionally taxed. My point being, all right, it's, these aren't meant to be affordable housing units. They pay into affordable housing trust fund, right, which we're working 
If you have any idea how hard it is to build affordable housing in New Jersey, it's insane, all right? You could build the Taj Mahal before you could build affordable housing in this state. We jumped through how many hoops in how many areas to try to use our trust fund to start this and get this off the ground. And we so, have three that we're still in discussion with. And we're still three in discussion. There's supposed to be affordable housing in the probation site, mm -hmm. to my knowledge. I'd like to just answer because you directed some of this directly to me. When we look at, when this council looks at a new development coming into our downtown specifically, and whether we're going to consider it for, for a pilot or something that we want to negotiate, there's three questions we ask ourselves. All right. The first is, is it meet with our vision of the city? And one of the main visions that we have with the city is how are we going to make everyone, yes, inclusive and diverse, everyone be able to afford to live in Hackensack? And one of the biggest complaints we had from our residents in this town was that their taxes were too high, that the tax rate was all over the place. Whether you're a homeowner or you're a renter, if you're a renter, your, your rent's going to go up because the, the owner of your building's taxes are going up. So we said, how do we solve that problem? This solves the problem for everyone, not anyone in particular, not any race in particular, mm -hmm. but everyone that lives in Hackensack. Right? And the way to, the let me finish. And the way to do that was to take a piece of property, our downtown, where basically no one was living. Virtually no one was living. It was, it was businesses that were deteriorating and paying minimal amount of taxes. To us, that was an unclaimed jewel, that we have two train stations and a bus terminal here. If we can bring revenue from our downtown, you're not upsetting any other racial balance or socioeconomic balance in the city. You're addressing an area that's going to benefit everyone. And the proof of the pudding is it worked because this year the municipal tax had a zero increase. And if our projections stay on track for the next four years, your municipal taxes will have a zero increase. We're giving our residents a break from what was going on here for the past 30 years where you would have a year where your taxes would go up 8%, 12%. We're addressing everyone, not one specific group or another, but everyone in the city. So, so, our, um, let me finish. so our questions first, does it meet with our vision for the city? Second, does it maintain the integrity of our neighborhoods? That's critical to us. So we're not plopping these in the middle of, of areas where they don't belong. We're not affecting some of our residential communities. We're, we're putting this new business primarily in our downtown and we've, we've offset one by each train station to see how it goes. That's it. You thought about building anything for veterans? We have, I, I have been, time at the county. Right, this is not supposed to be a back and forth, okay. but I will tell you personally, and, and, and Ted, you can, you can verify, we have met with numerous organizations to try and jumpstart a, a real good affordable housing project. Believe me, it is what, what the mayor said, it is not easy. First of all, there's only a select few number of developers that will even engage in that conversation or be willing to do that. Secondly, it's a huge process. It's a very lengthy process where they have to, this developer has to go through, jump through all kinds of hoops because the only way they can make it work financially is to get federal and state tax credits. Tax credit. And this is a very lengthy process. And yes, we're collecting money and putting it into affordable trust funds so we can supplement that. So we can take whatever monies we have and say, here, we'll help you to get this affordable housing done and built. And we're currently engaged with three different organizations right now in three different locations trying to get this to happen. I cannot disclose that information because it is not public. Let me finish. It is not public information because you cannot affect the competitive business. Once these things are public information, once they're hitting planning board, then we share, we could share as much information as we can with you. But we can't do that prior. But that's the reality of what's going on here. And it's to benefit, plan? it's to benefit everyone in the city. And that's, that's what's been going on in the city. Where can I get a copy of your master plan? The current master plan? Oh, clerk's office. Go to the clerk's right, office. Good. Thanks for your help. Thank you. Next, please. It's actually on the website. It's on the website. It's on the website under redevelopment. We are, we're in the process of updating it right now, and we will be presenting the update very soon. Thanks to Fran, right? Yeah. Um, I think it would be a real hardship if you allow the YMCA to leave the city of Hackensack. They have been a landmark here for years. They've helped so many people. They address people of all ages. Every, every um, male, females, people who are sick, people who are well, the programs after school, the camps, they, they've, been, they've been such an asset to the city of Hackensack. 
you, you plan on visions, you plan on bringing all these people to Hackensack. What are you bringing them here for? You, you bring them here because they're near a train station, but to have a, a facility that's open 12 months a year, a pool, you don't have to worry about the weather. It's not, it's not a park, it's not an outdoor facility. Uh, a pool that's open to everybody and it's open 12 months a year. Family memberships, I was so impressed by their presentation when they came to us asking for your help and you just ignored them like they were like nothing. And this is a vision, this should be part of your vision. You just ignored them, no, you asked, they asked if they could have Johnson, if they could have Johnson Park and you said no. No, we did not, Kathy. Yeah, well, no. they're not in Johnson Park and that's where they should be because the, the, the property that they're going to sell is going to bring a good piece of chunk. It's a salvo. They yes. want a piece of property that we don't even own. Excuse me? They want a piece of property that's not for sale and we don't own. They don't want, they yeah. just want to build their facility on, in Johnson Park. In the, in the parking lot, which Sears owns. Which they would no, like us to buy and give it to them. But we, so we said we were going to buy that because they only own a piece of it. They only own a piece of it. And we should buy that before Sears it. sells it to somebody, well, to somebody else because if you need it for whatever. Story, but they wanted us to buy that lot and give it to them. That when, the, when the piece of property, well, maybe if, if they get enough of money for their property, because it's going to go back on the tax they, rolls, they could buy that piece of property. They still want us to buy the they property. They want us to give them, them the land. Regardless the of how much they sell They want the you to for. buy the parking lot also? Do we get a price tag yes. on that? Because we've been trying to buy that for, for years. That's, that it's can't not be currently right. for sale. That's right. It's what? It's not it's for not sale. Not oh, sure, they're holding out until they're going to get the big end. bucks for it. Okay, but don't let them leave. Find them, a, find them a place, work with them. You work with all these other developers who we don't know from, from Adams, who are not giving us so anything. So if they were willing to pay for property, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. They don't even want to, they don't want to, if they sell their property for a good, for a good piece of money, we could use, they could use that money to buy No, they won't. they won't. They won't, Kathleen. Yeah. They need the money to They want us to give them they the property. They have to give them the property. They will we pay nothing kind of towards property. the property. But it's only, it's not even an acre we're talking about. It's where we had no, the ice skating ring. Yeah. That's not a big piece, that's not a big piece yeah. of property. Okay, well, so just try to work with them. We work with all these changes. Kathleen, if you're going to accuse us of things, just have the facts. They want us to give them a piece of property for free. Yes, they want you. No, they're, 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 they're giving you. They they're giving you build. their land that you're going to put back. No, in the no, no, no. They're, they're going to sell their land they're right. sell. and make but a nice profit. They're going to sell their land, but <laughs> they're giving it to you because it's going to go on the tax rolls, and they will be paying taxes on that property. They're not paying taxes, right, on the property they own now. And then the Hello? other where the new building is not, not paying pay taxes. Taxes, Kathy. So it's a, it's an even even. They're state. not paying taxes on the land they own now. They won't. If when they, when they the sell it, it will be it will be a rateable. Property, and so then they the other are. New property would not be rateable that we have to that they would like okay. us to give to them. We can't. You have to understand. That it's that. not rateable now, the Johnson Park. Please work with them and say you give you give. We are working with them. Kathleen, we and have a plan. That keep. It, it would be, be very be, sad to me, lose them. The it has rateable. to be. It has to be a plan that has a benefit financially as well to the city. It has a benefit to you by selling their property. They're putting it back on the tax rolls, and that's instant money right there. But then the other one would be tax free. It's, it's, you're you're still aware. getting money where you never got it before. You know, just think about it because everything it's is for the Everything is for the think about what you're saying. The, the new property wouldn't be taxable. Be a wash. Next, please. I go home. I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> Me Peter too. Peter Marcus Annie, Davis <laughs> Avenue. Do you have pizza to make? I, I don't have it. Yeah, I do. I'll see you soon. I'm going to get the ingredients. Uh, you know, I, I don't know much. I have no skin in the game. I'm not a person. I actually learned to swim in the Y in Montclair when I was young, now that I think about it. But uh, I see this as, uh, you know, I've come to the conclusion, now I know there is no such thing as a nonprofit. I have no idea what a nonprofit is, uh, I, other than that they take and spend all the money they make, and then there's no profit. That's what it comes down to. The Y, if they had an interest, uh, could, and they have money, they could take this building, modify it, work on it, do whatever has to be done to improve it. Wouldn't be the same thing that they would like with outdoor tennis courts, perhaps, and all the other things they propose. But I agree, they're looking for the opportunity now, because of the work that you people have done with redevelopment downtown, this is a land grab. This is something that they can sell, they can turn over and make a tremendous profit on by getting that property and hold the city hostage by saying, oh, you know, the city is anti Y, you know, they, we do so many good things. Well, they can do things in Bogota, they can do good things in South Atkinson, they can do good things anywhere within an easy driving distance, and it doesn't have to be here. And I'm, I'm glad that you haven't shut them out, that you're listening, that you're negotiating, 
but obviously you're not just going to roll over and say, you know, they can't leave under any circumstances. That would just be absurd. Thanks very much. And again, thank you for the Environmental Commission, Pedro. Great job. Woman of the year, woman of the century. Thank, thank you. you, Pete. <laughs> thank you. Anybody else in the public? We got 12 minutes in the back room. Let's <laughs> no, no, motion to close. Hey, Pete, Steve. Motion to close. Offering. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion to go into closed session. Offering. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Whereas we'll the mayor and council of the city of Hackensack deem it necessary to discuss certain actions under section 77 and 78 of the Open Public Meeting Act, which pertains to matters falling within attorney client privilege, ongoing litigation of personnel matters concerning the employment of current or prospective public employees. Whereas the mayor and council of the city of Hackensack is of the opinion that such circumstances may presently exist. And whereas the mayor and council wish to discuss the following issues, personnel matters, ongoing litigation, matters involving attorney-client privilege, matters involving the purchase, lease, or acquisition of real property, any pending or anticipated litigation or contract negotiations. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and council of the city of Hackensack deem it necessary to exclude the public from this discussion. The outcome of the discussion will be disclosed within 90 days, or at such time as the interests of the city do not require confidentiality. Uh, workers' compensation matter, Lorenzo Lett versus Hackensack. Anything else that I can bring up in the next 12 minutes, I'll announce at the end of the closed session. We'll probably be back out about 10, 10 after, quarter after. You have a lot, Mr. Emmerberg? I have a bit. I'm going to get it done 12 minutes. All right. I need a motion to come out of closed session. Okay. All in favor? Aye. None opposed? And we are done with the cow session. We can close that. Motion to close the cow session. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.